Welcome to the Yale 20 video on GI bleeds. My name is Matthew Ehrlich. I'm a resident in the Internal Medicine and Pediatrics program. My name is Niloufar Najafian. I'm also a resident in Internal Medicine here at Yale. Our faculty advisor was Deborah Proctor, who's a member of the gastroenterology department here at Yale. As with all Yale 20 videos, we will be breaking the topic down, starting with a five minute assessment of the patient intended to quickly answer the question of how sick the patient is and what level of care they will need. Next, we will go through how to evaluate and work up GI bleeds. Because an upper GI bleed is often very distinct from middle and lower GI bleed in presentation and management, the first section will focus on identifying where in the GI tract the bleed is coming from. Then we will discuss the management of the problem, focusing first on upper GI bleeds and then on middle and lower. And finally, we will discuss writing an assessment and plan as well as take home points. First, let's begin with our five minute bedside assessment of a patient. You are caring for a 45 year old male on a medicine floor admitted with diabetes as well as end-stage renal on hemodialysis. You're paged by a nurse who tells you that the patient has just had a large episode of melanoma. First, start with the basics by assessing the ABCs and vital signs. Remember that the most specific early sign of a severe bleed is tachycardia. The next step is you should be asking yourself if the patient is stable or unstable. Are they in shock? If they have decreased level of consciousness, that could be a sign that they need to be intubated. You should also ensure they have good IV access for fluid resuscitation, as a stable patient can quickly become unstable. We will get more in depth on what key features of past medical history to consider, your exam and what labs are important, but a big part of your five minute assessment should be quickly considering important past medical history and risk factors such as a history of cirrhosis or anticoagulation use. Exam findings that might suggest a diagnosis, such as stigmata of cirrhosis. If the patient has had melana or hematemesis and the nurse has saved it, you should visualize it for yourself. And then order the basic labs that will help guide your next steps. Finally, a prompt GI consult may be a part of your early management if you believe the patient is unstable or will need early intervention. It is important to qualify all of this with the understanding that there are a wide variety of GI bleeds. The urgent approach recommended here may not apply to a patient with known hemorrhoids who has had small streaking of blood in his stool. The content of this video will focus primarily on bleeds that are at risk of causing acute problems for the patient. In any of those situations, this framework is applicable. As you assess the patient, you see he is tachycardic, hypotensive, and seems a bit confused. And he has had prior episodes of melana. As you attempt to determine the source of the bleed in the GI tract, keep in mind that a history of prior upper GI bleed is strongly predictive of a current upper GI bleed. You begin stabilization efforts with IV access and fluids. When you send the labs, you note that the hemoglobin is 8. This should tell you right away that this is potentially a very sick patient. Important predictors of severe GI bleed are hematemesis, comorbidities such as cirrhosis or malignancy, hemodynamic instability, and a hemoglobin level less than eight. That said, if early labs show a hemoglobin greater than eight, that's not always a reliable marker. This raises an important learning pearl which is that the patient is losing whole blood rather than just RBCs. This means that it may take over 24 hours for the patient to equilibrate so that our lab tests accurately reflect the degree of blood loss. This is why we pay close attention to vitals as they tell us more about the current physiological response. So now let's talk about how to triage these patients. A patient with persistent hemodynamic instability despite adequate fluid resuscitation, any patient with a high-risk bleed, such as variceal bleed 
or a rapid, rapid peptic ulcer bleed that might require urgent endoscopy should probably be triaged to the ICU. A patient who was unstable but improved with fluid, who may need closer attention due to the need for frequent blood draws or possibly urgent EGD down the line, is probably most suited for the step-down unit. Finally, a patient who had an episode of melana but never showed any evidence of hemodynamic instability has maintained a stable hemoglobin and will not need emergent intervention is probably okay to be watched on the floor. One of the most critical determinations when dealing with a GI bleed is determining where the bleeding is coming from, as this will have important implications for evaluation, management, and prognosis. At the same time, your initial evaluation should also be considering the severity of the bleed. So let's start off by reviewing some anatomy. The upper GI tract includes the esophagus, the stomach, and the proximal duodenum. 63% of all GI bleeds are upper. The saying that the most common cause of a lower GI bleed is an upper GI bleed is meant to suggest that most often, the blood that makes its way to the lower portions of the GI tract originates in segments above the ligament of trites. Middle GI bleeds, are sometimes called small bowel bleeding, are the least common cause of GI bleeds, accounting for about 5-10% to of all bleeding in the GI tract. This spans from the ampulla of Vader to the ileocecal valve. Lastly, the colon and the rectum make up the area that accounts for lower GI bleeds. This makes up approximately 20% of GI bleeds. This leaves about 10% of GI bleeds with unclear sources. In our patient, we have determined he is bleeding on the basis of his episode of melana. So let's start by reviewing some of the key clinical findings that point to a GI bleed, as these tell us, first, that the patient is bleeding in their GI tract, and second, provide clues as to the location of the bleed. Hematemesis simply means the vomiting of blood, which could be bright red in appearance or coffee ground. Coffee ground implies that it has been exposed to gastric acid, leading to oxidation of the iron in the heme. This suggests bleeding either from the stomach or from a source above the stomach that has been swallowed into the stomach. Copious amounts of frank blood may imply a more severe bleed. Melina is the classic black tarry stool that occurs when blood is exposed to stomach acid in the GI tract. It can be seen with as little as 50 cc's of blood loss, but also in a massive GI bleed. It is usually from the upper GI tract, though can be seen when one swallows blood from oro or nasopharyngeal bleeds. It suggests the blood has spent greater than 14 hours in the GI tract. Hematochesia refers to frank blood in the stool and is usually bright red or maroon colored. This is more frequently associated with a lower GI bleed. However, a brisk upper GI bleed is the source for 10 to 15% of patients with severe hematochesia. Finally, though we'll spend less time on it, it is important to be aware of the term occult GI bleed, which refers to bleeding that is not visibly apparent, unlike the previous examples. It may not have a clear source right away. This is often identified with a fecal occult blood test. You have to have a reason to suspect occult blood in order to look for it. For example, one might suspect an occult bleed in a patient with unexplained iron deficiency anemia. Let's talk about some of the key points in evaluating your patient that will give you clues as to where the bleeding may be coming from, along with key features to help you risk stratify and manage your patient. First, consider findings that might give you a clue to a location. A reported finding of melana has a positive likelihood ratio of over 5 for an upper GI bleed. That number actually goes up to 25 if observed by the examiner. Likewise, hematemesis also suggests an upper GI source. Bright red blood per rectum can be more difficult to interpret as streaking might suggest a lower GI source, but as previously mentioned, a brisk upper GI bleed is the explanation for 
10 to 15% of cases of hematochesia. Additionally, a patient's history can provide important clues on the location and possible severity. Prior history of GI bleed in the tract can be an important clue, as is the presence of cirrhosis and whether it's compensated or decompensated, which may also reflect a level of severity. We will discuss these further, but repaired AAAs, valvular disease, hemorrhoids, IBD, and diverticulosis can all be important suggestive clues. In your quick assessment, a history of advanced renal disease, malignancy, or heart disease can also be important factors predicting more severe or higher risk bleeds. A history of NSAID use might point to an upper GI source. Any antiplatelet or anticoagulation therapy could explain the cause as well as the risk of further bleeding. And a quick review of over-the-counter medications might also prove to be useful. In addition, any evaluation should also include a targeted review of systems that might suggest a more severe bleed, such as fatigue, lightheadedness, orthostatic symptoms, syncope, abdominal pain, or chest pain. Once we have assessed vitals, we can proceed with the rest of our physical exam. Orthostatic vitals should be performed, but you should also be aware of their limitations. While they have been shown to be quite sensitive once the patient has lost a large volume of blood, greater than 650 cc's, their sensitivity for a moderate volume blood loss is only 11 to 50 percent. Thus, they may not tell you if a patient only has a mild bleed or if they are just in the early stages of significant blood loss. Next, you should look at the patient's general appearance. What do they look like? Are they resting comfortably? Do they seem anxious? Are they somnolent? Or are they writhing in pain? On your HEENT exam, look for things like scleral icterus that might be suggestive of cirrhosis, or look in the mouth and nares for evidence of a bleed that might be above the level of the esophagus. When listening to the heart, Keep in mind that aortic stenosis is associated with Hyde syndrome. Seen in this picture on the right, shear stress associated with stenotic aortic valves leads to degradation of von Willebrand factor on platelets, resulting in intestinal angiodysplasia. It is also important to take note of their volume status, considering things like pulmonary edema or JVD, which may mean you have to be more cautious with transfusions. In their abdominal exam, epigastric pain might suggest the presence of an ulcer or gastritis that is prone to bleeding. Make sure you don't miss any signs of acute abdomen that might imply a perforation. Also, assess for ascites, which could be an indicator of cirrhosis and portal hypertension. Your neuro exam should look for specific stigmata of hepatic encephalopathy, such as asterixis, but also pay close attention to the overall mental status as it may be a critical marker of the severity of the bleed. Again, your skin exam may reveal additional stigmata of cirrhosis, such as spider angiomata, seen here on the right, or jaundice. Lastly, do not forget to perform a rectal exam as direct visualization of melanotic stool by the examiner is very helpful in determining the source and severity of the bleed. We mentioned the most important labs you should be checking in your workup of the patient. A CBC, a CMP rather than a BMP, so you can see liver transaminases and synthetic function, coags, to see if there is coagulopathy of liver failure or any coagulopathy that may need to be reversed with blood products, lactate to ascertain any end organ damage, and lastly, an active type and screen, which is critical to ensure appropriately matched transfusions can be given without delay. If the patient has a rapid rise in BUN that's disproportionate to the rise in creatinine, that can be strongly suggestive of upper GI bleed, though with the caveat that this does not hold in renal failure. A hemoglobin of less than 8 may indicate a more severe bleed.
If there is concern for perforation, as you may see in the case of a bleeding duodenal ulcer, one of the quickest tests might be a KUB, looking for free air under the diaphragm. Now that we have reviewed the initial assessment to locate and triage GI bleed, we are going to focus on the diagnosis and management of the most common and typically most severe type of GI bleed, which is those coming from the upper GI tract. First, let's start with the evaluation of an upper GI bleed and review some tools used to assess the severity. The Rockall score is meant to be used to assess the severity of an upper GI bleed before the patient has received an endoscopy. Using data only available immediately at presentation, such as age, vitals suggestive of a shock state, and comorbidities, it has been shown to predict the risk of further bleed and death in a population of patients hospitalized with an upper GI bleed. The Glasgow Blatchford score incorporates clinical and laboratory data that should be quickly available after the initial lab draws. It has been shown to predict the need for intervention, such as transfusion and endoscopic or surgical therapy, as well as death in patients in the hospital with an upper GI bleed. Let's review the differential diagnosis for upper GI bleeding. Recall that upper GI bleeds represent over 60% of all GI bleeding. As we look through this table, one thing that stands out is that peptic ulcer disease represents a significant majority of the causes of upper GI bleeding. Other common causes include gastritis and duodenitis, which have similar distinguishing features as peptic ulcer disease. Other differentials to consider include esophageal varices, Mallory Weiss tears, GI malignancy, arteriovenous malformations, esophagitis, and dulafoy ulcers. Although it's rare, an aortoenteric fistula can lead to rapid hemorrhage, shock, and ultimately death if not urgently addressed. Because of the high pressure aorta serving as the source of the blood loss, this is an important consideration in a patient with a history of a AAA repair. Now, let us discuss the management of an upper GI bleed first in patients without cirrhosis. The mainstays of stabilization efforts will be volume resuscitation with a crystalloid fluid, blood transfusions, and we will discuss target hemoglobins shortly, protecting the airway with endotracheal intubation if necessary, and prompt GI consult and or MICU evaluation if needed. You will also want to ensure that you have good IV access on the patient and that you have drawn all the labs that have been mentioned. One of the most important questions when managing GI bleeds is who needs a transfusion? Studies have shown that in general, outcomes are improved when a restrictive transfusion threshold is met, meaning that patients are transfused only when hemoglobin is less than seven grams per deciliter. This table highlights some of the key findings from a 2013 study done by Villanueva et al. on transfusion strategies in acute upper GI bleeding. The study found that when a restrictive strategy was applied, not only did patients require fewer transfusions, but had improved mortality, lower rates of further bleeding, fewer variceal bleeds in those with a history of cirrhosis, shorter hospitalization stays, and less complications of transfusions, such as transfusion reactions or TACO. Once your patient is stabilized, subsequent management should involve monitoring of vital signs to assess both for response to therapies as well as watching out for worsening or progression of the bleed. Monitoring a CBC with your frequency being determined by your level of concern. In addition to whatever red blood cell transfusions are needed, you may also need to correct any coagulopathies. You should also stop all antiplatelet and anticoagulation therapy the patient is already on and do not start the patient on any prophylactic anticoagulation, though you should use SCDs as many of these patients may simultaneously be high risk for a development of a DVT. PPIs lower gastric acid secretion the higher pH environment leads to stabilization of blood clots, 
use of IV PPIs pre-endoscopically has been shown to reduce active bleeding and high-risk stigmata of bleeding upon performing the endoscopy. However, it has not been shown to lead to improved clinical outcomes. Nonetheless, if endoscopy is delayed or cannot be performed, treatment with PPI is usually initiated. Following endoscopy, there is evidence to suggest that 72 hours of IV PPI therapy followed by oral therapy reduces the risk of further bleeding, the need for surgery, and lowers mortality, particularly in patients who have an ulcer with active bleeding, a non-bleeding visible vessel, or an adherent clot. In terms of dosing, the 2012 American Society of Gastroenterology guidelines call for the use of continuous PPI infusions in the first 72 hours. However, more recent data suggests that intermittent twice-daily dosing is non-inferior, with a trend towards superior when compared with continuous infusion. Thus, the general practice is to initiate patients with a suspected upper GI bleed on twice-daily dosing of IV PPIs. A notable exception are those patients with an actively bleeding ulcer, visible vessel, or adherent clot. These patients still stand to benefit from a 72-hour continuous infusion. Finally, consider the timing of endoscopy. Keep in mind that EGD is the definitive test to determine the source of upper GI bleed, even if we have used our history and exam to help narrow our differential. It is also the therapeutic method of treatment where EGD visualizes evidence of active bleed or stigmata that is high risk for rebleed, such as non-rebleeding visible vessel or an adherent clot. Treatment modalities include injection therapies, thermocoagulation, and hemostatic clips, amongst others. When patients are admitted with suspected upper GI bleed, if they are low risk, namely they are hemodynamically stable and without major comorbidities, they probably do not need emergent intervention. However, they should probably receive an EGD in less than 24 hours, as this has been shown to reduce duration of hospital stay as well as lower costs. High-risk patients, thinking back to some of the features in the Glasgow Blatchford score that might put someone in this category, are the ones who might require a midnight call to the GI consult for emergent intervention. The management of suspected variceal bleed in a patient known to have cirrhosis differs in a few important ways. When thinking about volume resuscitation, you may consider administering albumin if the patient has an albumin below 2.5 grams per deciliter. Additionally, the risks of over resuscitation may be more pronounced as it can cause rebound portal hypertension, which may lead to worsening bleeding or rebleeding due to increased pressure within the portal system. You will want the same labs as in all other upper GI bleeds, but pay very close attention to coags. Hepatocytes are responsible for the production of most blood clotting factors, and end-stage liver disease can be associated with severe factor deficiencies and therefore increased bleeding risk. The management of a variceal bleed consists of the same elements of managing a non-variceal bleed with a few additional components. First, these are patients who may be higher risk for requiring an ICU admission as variceal bleeds can rapidly progress to shock. You should transfuse platelets if they're less than 50,000, and knowing that a coagulopathy is common in liver disease, you should consider correcting it if it's severe, but know that there is no evidence to suggest improved outcomes with correction of coagulopathy. And as mentioned previously, this needs to be balanced with the dangers of excess transfusion leading to rebound portal hypertension. Additionally, all of these patients should be placed on an octreotide trip. Octreotide is a somatostatin analog that causes splanchnic vasoconstriction by opposing vasodilatory peptides such as glucagon and may have some vasoconstrictive effects on its own. This has the effect of reducing portal inflow, thereby helping to achieve hemostasis. However, it has not been shown to clearly reduce mortality. Other vasoconstrictors that have been examined are vasopressin and terlopressin,
vasopressin, which directly constricts mesenteric arterioles, is generally not used over octreotide, as the benefits of decreased splanchnic blood flow appear to be counterbalanced by the risks of non-splanchnic vasoconstriction that can cause myocardial, bowel, cerebral, or limb ischemia. Terlopressin, a synthetic analog of vasopressin, appears to have fewer side effects, and unlike octreotide or vasopressin, it has been shown in studies to lead to reduced mortality. However, it is unfortunately currently only used in practice in Europe, as it is not right now available in the U.S. Lastly, patients with cirrhosis who develop an upper GI bleed are very high risk for developing bacterial infections, such as peritonitis from translocation of GI flora. Use of prophylactic antibiotics has been shown to decrease the rate of infections and increase survival. The preferred regimen for this is usually five days of ceftriaxone, with oral norfloxacin or ciprofloxacin available as alternatives, though this depends on the local profile of quinolone resistance. Once pharmacologic therapy has been initiated, most cases of acute variceal bleed will require active intervention, which you will want to do within 12 hours. Most commonly, the management for bleeding esophageal varices will be band ligation, which involves placing an elastic band around the varix. Gastric varices can be more difficult to control as they can only be banded when on the lesser curvature of the stomach. In the case of difficult to control bleeding gastric or esophageal varices, IR angiography may be considered. Balloon tamponade is frequently used when there is an urgent need to achieve control. A balloon is introduced into the esophagus or further into the stomach and inflated to apply pressure to the site of bleeding. This method can be very effective at achieving immediate control of hemorrhage in about 80% of cases. However, there is a high risk for complications and high risk for rebleeding once the balloon is deflated. Thus, this is generally just a temporizing measure for patients in which a more definitive therapy is being planned. One such definitive treatment is a transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt, also known as TIPS. For patients whose bleeding cannot be controlled through the previously mentioned approaches or patients who have had multiple bleeds, TIPS creates a shunt from the high-pressure portal vein to the inferior vena cava, thereby relieving some of the pressure within the portal system. This can be very effective, but be aware that there are risks associated with TIPS, including worsening liver failure, as the portal vein is responsible for the majority of hepatic perfusion, and increased rates of encephalopathy, as toxins that lead to hepatic encephalopathy are increasingly bypassing the liver. Once the acute episode of bleeding has been controlled, it is important to think about prevention as a prior bleed is a major risk factor for repeat upper GI bleeds. Prevention is guided by the specific risk factors of the patient. In the event of a bleeding ulcer, during the EGD, the patient should have a biopsy specimen taken and then sent for testing for H. pylori, and then the patient should be treated if it's appropriate try to avoid NSAIDs, but if absolutely necessary, COX-2 selective NSAIDs plus a PPI is the preferred regimen. Aspirin should be stopped if it's only being used for primary prevention of vascular disease. If it's in use for secondary prevention, then it should be resumed at the lowest dose along with a PPI within seven days of the bleed. In patients with idiopathic bleeding ulcers that are not associated with H. pylori or NSAIDs, then long-term therapy with a PPI is indicated. Prevention of variceal rebleeds involves endoscopic therapy to eradicate varices and medical optimization to lower portal pressures, generally with non-selective beta blockers. In patients who have had esophageal variceal bleeds, Endoscopic ligation should be repeated every one to two weeks until obliteration of all varices, at which point repeat EGD surveillance is performed one to three months after obliteration, then every six to 12 months.
Because we don't know the exact dose at which optimal effect of beta blockade is achieved, generally it is titrated to the highest dose possible without lowering the heart rate below 55 to 60 beats per minute. And again, in those patients who have proven very difficult to control, TIPS is also a non-emergent option to prevent future episodes. Now we are going to discuss middle and lower GI bleeding. As discussed previously, lower GI sources account for 20% of all GI bleeds and middle sources account for about 5 to 10%. Not all patients with lower GI bleeding will require hospitalization. Based on the 2008 Scottish Intercollegiate Guidelines Network, you may be able to avoid hospitalizing the patient if you meet the following four criteria. Age, less than 60 years old. No hemodynamic instability. No evidence for ongoing rectal bleeding, which you may be able to assess by presence of gross blood on your initial digital rectal exam or a recurrent hematochesia. Identification of an obvious anal rectal source, for example, a hemorrhoid. You should consider hospitalization in a lower GI bleed with any of the following high-risk features, age greater than 60, ongoing rectal bleeding, hemodynamic instability, presence of two or more comorbid illnesses based on the Charlson Comorbid Index, which is a validated weighted score of comorbid disease, and use of antiplatelets or anticoagulant medications. Lower GI bleeding typically occurs in older individuals and presents as acute bright red blood parectum or red or maroon colored stool, which is what we refer to as hematochesia. Hemodynamic instability is seen less often, but if present, could raise the possibility of a briskly bleeding upper GI source. The differential can be very broad. Diverticulosis accounts for about 30%, hemorrhoids 14%, intestinal ischemia 12%, inflammatory bowel disease 9%, with post-polypectomy, colon cancer and polyps, rectal ulcer, vascular ectasia, radiation colitis or proctitis, and additional miscellaneous causes representing the remaining 24%. Middle GI sources, as we have mentioned, are the least common cause of all GI bleeding, but have a wide array of possible causes. The more common causes are seen on the left side of this table. In patients under 40 years of age, middle GI bleeding may actually be a presentation of IBD. In both age groups, neoplasia and Dulafloy's lesions, which are torturous arterioles that erode into the mucosa of the duodenum, may be common culprits. On the right-hand column, you can see a large number of more rare causes of middle GI bleeding. The mainstays of stabilization and initial treatment in middle and lower GI bleeds are no different than an upper GI bleed, in part because in a real clinical setting, you may not have determined the source of your bleed before action is required. So, just like an upper GI bleed, you must closely monitor vitals and blood counts, ensure good IV access, and provide volume resuscitation and transfusions as needed. Colonoscopy has both diagnostic and therapeutic value. It is the study of choice when lower GI bleed is suspected. Colonoscopy should be performed after adequate preparation with four to six liters of polyethylene glycol, to facilitate visualization of the colonic mucosa and diagnosis of the bleed. Therapies for active bleeding include clips for diverticular bleeds and thermal therapy for angioectasia. When upper and lower endoscopy have failed to locate the source of bleeding or when brisk ongoing hematochesia precludes adequate hemodynamic resuscitation and bowel preparation before a colonoscopy, an angiography can allow for visualization and embolization of the vessels supplying the bleed. This can be a very effective means of controlling the bleed. However, this requires a bleeding rate of at least 0.5 to 1 milliliters per minute. 
It also comes with the risk of serious complications, such as intestinal infarction, thrombus, and renal failure. Although it's not a therapeutic method, tagged RBC scans can be useful when there is a concern for ongoing bleed. They can localize active bleeds with a rate as low as 0.1 to 0.4 milliliters per minute. This can be used as a screening test before angiography or emergent surgery. The management of a middle GI bleed can vary from conservative treatment with iron therapy to manage iron deficiency anemia created by ongoing small volume blood loss or more aggressive measures such as angiography in the case of brisk active bleeds. The indication for the various treatments are beyond the scope of this video, but one additional diagnostic method to be aware of is a video capsule endoscopy, a pill-sized camera that records images of the GI tract. This can be very useful in identifying the source of bleeding when no source has been identified by upper or lower endoscopic evaluation. This chart was adopted from the American Journal of Gastroenterology Guidelines on Management of Patients with Acute Lower GI Bleed and summarizes the management and treatment of lower GI bleeds with two different pathways for patients with high and low. We will now finish with a summary of how you should write up your assessment and plan in a patient with an acute GI bleed. We will begin with the assessment. Your assessment should describe the severity of the bleed. Does it appear brisk or slow? Where in the GI tract you believe the bleed is coming from and why? Documenting the pertinent negatives along with the positives that are informing this. Describe the patient's risk factors for a GI bleed and summarize this information with your differential diagnosis. At this point, you can proceed with the plan. As we have discussed, you will usually have already taken steps to stabilize your patient, so in the first part of your plan, you should describe what has already been done. Given the risk of continued bleed or rebleed, describe what you have done anticipating this problem, such as ensuring good access and maintaining an active type and screen. Describe the plan for monitoring your patient with vitals and labs and how frequently you will be checking these knowing that the more severe the bleed, the more frequent the checks will be required. Then you should describe your plan for involving the specialists. Have they already been notified? If not, what changes would then prompt you to call them? And now let's review a sample assessment and plan. Miss S is a 74-year-old lady with a history notable for AFib on warfarin, OA with daily NSAID use, who is presenting with multiple episodes of dark tarry stools. Given her frequent NSAID use, epigastric tenderness on exam, and melena, the most likely diagnosis is an upper GI bleed from peptic ulcers. Also on the differential is Mallory Weiss tear, vascular ectasia, mucosal erosion, and neoplastic disease. I do not suspect a variceal bleed as she has no history or risk factors for cirrhosis and exhibits no stigmata on exam. She is currently hemodynamically stable with a baseline blood pressure of 130 over 70 and a heart rate of 75. Thus, I do not suspect she currently has a severe GI bleed, though her age and use of anticoagulants put her at increased risk warranting careful inpatient observation. As for the plan, we will consider 10 units of vitamin K to expedite warfarin reversal pending the INR. We will be holding the warfarin. We will maintain at least two large bore IVs, greater than 18 gauge. We'll monitor the vital signs Q4 hours, trend in h, &H Q6, and maintain active type and screen. If hemodynamically stable, but dropping the hemoglobin less than seven, we'll transfuse a unit. We will consult GI for question of endoscopic intervention, maintain NPO status. If she develops hypotension or worsening tachycardia, we'll call urgent GI consult, ICU to assess the patient, and consider administration of FFP or PCC, or Kcentra, for warfarin reversal. We'll start IVPPI BID given the concern for peptic ulcer disease and maintain DVT prophylaxis with SCDs.
As a last bonus, we will also review the process of calling a consultant. The important thing to remember is that whenever calling a consult, your goal should be to effectively and concisely communicate information about the patient and your clinical question. So, you should introduce yourself and tell them you are requesting a new consult. Then give the patient's name, location in the hospital, and medical record number so that the consultant can look the patient up. You should briefly describe the patient's key presenting features, relevant history and risk factors, their vitals and labs, how they seem right now, any interventions thus far, and then state your question or request for the consultant. So for example, when calling a GI consultant, you could say the following, introduce yourself and tell them that you're the medical student on the internal medicine service, at which point you could say, I'm calling for a GI consult for Miss Jane Doe with MR 111 on floor 5 West. She was admitted overnight with one day of melena. She has a history of AFib and is on warfarin. She had an upper GI bleed two years ago from NSAID-related peptic ulcer disease. Her last hemoglobin was 11, but she's had worsening tachycardia to 105 with her blood pressure dropping to 100 over 60 from a baseline of 130 over 70. I did a rectal exam and I saw melena. I'm concerned she has developed a severe acute upper GI bleed. She has good access and we've been running fluids. Could you please evaluate her and see if she warrants endoscopic intervention? Let's review some take home points. As you are first assessing the patient, consider the age, vital signs, and comorbidities. These can tell you a great deal about the severity of the bleed before you even have labs. Ideally, you should determine where in the GI tract the bleed is originating from. This will determine the nature of the intervention. All patients, regardless of what type of bleed, should first be stabilized with good IV access, fluids as needed, and close monitoring of both vitals and h, &H. Unstable patients who don't respond to immediate interventions or those who become unstable despite initial efforts require urgent GI evaluation and escalation of care if they are on a floor. The transfusion threshold for stable GI bleed is a hemoglobin less than 7. More liberal thresholds have been shown to cause harm. However, if a patient has rapid ongoing losses or a history of cardiovascular disease, the threshold may be higher. For more information on this topic, there are a number of useful clinical guidelines published by the American College of Gastroenterology, amongst other groups. These provide the Society's recommendations on these topics. Other helpful articles to review are listed below as well. Last but not least, we'd like to thank and acknowledge the following people who assisted in making this video. Dr. Proctor, our faculty advisor, and Dr. Connolly, who also contributed to the content of the CL20.